Uh, the last session of the uh, of the day, and it's appropriate that we fill all the chairs? it's the last lap, guys. Oops. We can uh, just line up the music a little bit. Right. Okay. <laughs> Okay. It was a great movie, wasn't it? Um, the, uh, <laughs> okay, a couple of things. What's a hotel management agreement? <laughs> One word. <laughs> Stefan. Necessary. Necessary. Imprisonment. Imprisonment. <laughs> Headache. Headache. Relationship. Relationship. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, so we know who everybody is. <laughs> Operator. 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 Owner, owner. This, he runs a trade union for owners. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan, formerly an operator. Now an owner. Now an owner. Okay. Game, you know. um, righto. So what is it? It's a crazy relationship, unlike anything ever found in the commercial world. That's why we have to have sessions about it. It's not like a lease. It's not like anything else. It's like handing over your child. Who invented the idea? Conrad Hilton did. It's his first hotel. He went down to Cisco, Texas to buy a bank, ended up um, not buying a bank at all, ended up buying a hotel. He looked at it across the road and said, there's more money in that. Bought himself, that's the first hotel. Um, he was so successful, a little while later, one of the local uh, millionaires said to him, can you please lease my hotel? He said, I'm not going to lease it. I'm not going to take the economic risk on that hotel, but what I'll do is I'll manage it for you. So there we go, the Menga Hotel in San Antonio, Texas was the first managed hotel. So it's not a lease, it's an arrangement whereby because Conrad Hilton did such a good job operating it, he took over the operations of the hotel but wearing none of the economic risk. That all started it. So, we've got through the first thing of why we're going to build a hotel as opposed to a residential condo tower or whatever. You've made the decision at this particular point in time to build a hotel. And the question is, do you or not need an operator and what is it going to look like? Here's the value perception gap. You've got to understand that two people are looking at this from very different points of view. People say we need a community of interest to, to uh, together that we're all going to be on the same page. The answer is, it's not like that at all. Two, these two people are approaching this relationship quite differently. And I think the, the, step of, the point about it is, is to understand what an owner wants and what an operator wants, and we'll bring all that together. Okay, so, boat and land. Now, so, owner wants, owner. Kevin, how's this look for you? Healthy return, palace, the glamour, that's you, right? <laughs> where am I, down the bottom there? Yeah, where about you? Or, you <laughs> or is it all just a game? How does, that, how does that sit for you, Kevin, from an owner's point of view? We're just going to frame the discussion up a little bit at the moment around owner and operator. Yeah, help me out here. This is the first time I've seen this page. What's, what's the question? Sorry, John. Uh, um, one of those does, that, does that look like your sorts of, that you get up each day, those sorts of things that you want to do? Yes, I like top right, bottom left. You like a healthy return? Yes. Alice? Like a bit of glamour? No. Mm, not really. Not really. Not all right. A couple of your owners, though, would be pretty glamorous sort of people, wouldn't they? Simon? Uh, we have a few, but I think the days of the trophy owner, I mean, there are still trophy owners. Wherever there's new hot money that's been created, there will always be the ego-driven buyer. But honestly, it's a very small piece of the market. Right. You may have buyers who don't have a short-term IRR hurdle, uh, family owners who are investing basically for capital preservation for their grandchildren. But the number of people who simply want kind of a, an ego extension, I mean, they're there, but right. they're, they're a tiny fraction of the market. Right. Most people are looking for a healthy return first yeah. and foremost. Stefan, comment about that at all from the owners that you look after? Well, it's started as glamour, but ultimately it's healthy return. So maybe if you want to think of it 
take a Porsche 911. Yeah. It's glamorous, but it still retains its value. Okay, okay. Righto, operators. Our operators down the end, how does this work for you? Happy guests. That global should have the word domination next to it, which I think would be appropriate for our friends down the end of the table. Yeah, I think it's, uh, for us, it's happy guests it means like happy owner. So yep. it means like whenever we have a high occupancy, high average rate, it means like a return uh, investment for the owner. And for the long-term management fees, this is, uh, of course, that's what we, we expect for the, as an operator. Uh, and then as, as a trademark of the brand as a global. Yeah, I think you agree with all the three. Right, okay. I, I, can I challenge that? Yeah, yeah, I, sure. I, I don't no, think it's always idea. true to say that a happy guest means a happy <laughs> owner. A guest can be happy because you're selling it too cheaply, or they can be happy because you've overspec a property. <laughs> but in neither case are you going to have a happy owner. You're going to have a very unhappy owner. Yeah. So I there, think is a, there is a difference of Right, of I think it depends on the, how you measure the happy guest, because like, uh, like what we see, the correlation between a happy guest, what we have a guest satisfaction index, this is based on that when we see is the, the guest satisfaction index is high, this will impact to our GOP is high. That's what we can see the correlation between uh, 1,200 hotels. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's work yep. this up a little bit. I mean, the question is, you can do anything. You can, you can give the guest a free night. It'll be yep. a very happy guest, yeah. right? <laughs> very, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, now let, I mean, is there, we talk all about happy guests, but there's a question of trying to balance it from an owner's point of view. I want him to be happy, but I don't want him to be... It's all free. I don't want him to walk away with the farm, so to speak. Right. So we have to manage that a little bit. So you're saying there's a direct relationship between high GOPs and uh, guest satisfaction? Yes, all right. Yes. Your, your data shows that? Yes, because it's this what the, we collect yeah. is uh, uh, because we have a guest satisfaction index, right? So when we see the lower guest satisfaction index, usually is the GOP is uh, not really high. Right. I, mean, yes. I mean, nobody does an owner satisfaction index, but you can bet that some of the owners of some of the most luxurious <laughs> boutique Hotels, not yours, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but you can think of one or two brands in this region who run super luxury properties and yeah. they've never made a profit. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know, the guests are happy, but nobody does an owner true. satisfaction index. Perhaps we should invent one. Okay. Yes? Yeah, yeah I, would, I would agree. Uh, and all these three items here are probably not all for us. Um, the global thing is not for us. We're global bit, thing's not for you? Yeah, we're a bit more international, I would say. Right. Because we leave certain parts of the world out. But certainly, long-term management fees is something interesting. Uh, right. That's, that's why we're in the game. Okay. Yeah, um, I've actually been involved in a hotel up in Taiwan, which has recently opened, one of the luxury brands. Um, the guests are loving it, but we're in the red. And so there's a big argument with the owner saying, hang on, let's scale this back. We've got to try and get in the black some way. Stefan, you'd have that sort of situation from a... From a Again, Asset manager's point of view, which you do? There's a matter of education. I mean, here you, you use the word, the, the word opening, right? Yeah. I think it's important that owners understand that it's a bit of a ramp up in terms of profitability. Mm -hmm. right. So the operators get a bit of breathing space for the first you know, two or three years in order to stabilize the business. But after that, yeah, uh, they start to be a bit more uh, inquisitive. Let's put it okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, here's an issue about ramp up. In the industry, we say you look at a stabilized year, and we say a stabilized year is year three. So if you're looking at your hotel feasibility, go out to year three, put a cap rate on that, and that'll be the value of the hotel, roughly. Now, what do we think about this three-year ramp up? I know there's a couple of different points of view I've heard. Yeah. I think often owners are their own worst enemy because some owners, especially naive owners or new owners, will do a kind of auction of the forecast they get from the brands. And they'll naturally pick the brand that shows them the highest numbers. And usually in those cases, the highest numbers are the most wrong in the first few years. Most brands show you 15, 20% GOP in the first year. Most hotels make very little GOP in the first year. Right. So if you're an owner who's honestly inexperienced enough just to go for the highest set of numbers you see in the early years, you're probably making a mistake. Right. No, but I think in the brand's defense, I've seen a lot of times where they also ramp up fees, both reserve and management fees in the first few years. And I think you know, we underwrite to, I wouldn't say necessarily lose, but there's going to be a big ramp up, occupancy, mm -hmm. margin, flow through. And when we can get things aligned, like fees, and do one, two, three, four, and reserve or something like that, helps us do what we need to do to get right. through the early time. We're a medium term owner as it is, so that first few, getting that three years down to two years is important. <laughs> and if there's some fee alignment there, then already we're started off in the right okay. foot. So we yeah. have a lower base fee to start with and we start it up at the top. What about, what about the proposition that because of the platforms, because everything is so digital, everything is online, that the ramp up occurs more quickly now um, with dynamic pricing, a whole range of other issues that the three year period might in fact be closer to two. Anybody got a view about that yeah. at all? Yes, yeah? absolutely. I mean, I, I think 
you know, to, to put that three-year tag on it, that, that's nice and comfortable, and of yeah. course we like it. What I, I think it really depends on where you are, on the situation, and so we, we just opened a hotel, we, you know, it broke even after the first months. Right. Um, that's a dream, but it's a great location, and everything worked well in that particular scenario. Uh, I think, you know, you need to look at it in detail, and then yep. determine what's, what is the right, right. time frame for that particular I'd project. imagine if you had a lot of leisure business, which was relied upon long-term wholesale contracts, you're going to need a, a, a ramp-up period will be longer, <laughs> given the fact yeah. that those customers need to get comfortable with the asset. Sorry, the agents need to get comfortable with the asset before they send it. Well, you, you can mitigate that ramp up period by kind of having a, a mix that evolves over the years. You know what I'm saying? So as you said, maybe at the beginning, you have wholesale are difficult to, to get because the first year they wouldn't, it's too risky for them. They want to see the hotel operating. So maybe you're relying more on OTAs and eventually some kind of, you know, uh, corporate mice. Right. And over the years, then you want to revenue manage. So th that's something that needs to be done. But you need to take into account a lot of factors. I mean, the hardware, the market, the people you'll have. So, yeah. okay. And so, so maybe just one more thought, maybe something very trivial, but you know, if, if you get appointed 12 months or 18 months before the opening, uh, it's a completely different story if somebody selects you two months before they want to open. Well, two months. So that really is a big <laughs> impact. Okay, okay. Hey, we just, we don't even need these slides. Um, the issue, so we've got, we've got how long should the GM be appointed before hotel opening? Uh, Starwood's view is? <coughs> Starwood previously is 12 uh, months, but 12 now months? we go with six months. It's depending Between on the, 12 and yes, 6. Yes, yep. to 6. So you know as an owner you're paying for the GM as part of the pre-opening fees. 6 to 12, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, it sounds right. I'm more interested in how long is it going to stay, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, this two-year, three-year cycle. I mean, I think the peak is three to four years when they're really hitting on all cylinders. But because of the new supply and they're pulling people around, it's a year and a half, two years, you just got to knock on the door saying, whoa, you know, you want to pull out somebody already. So, yeah, you can start them at six months, nine months, five, but I'm right. looking and we're having conversations with all our brands. Okay, you know, realistically, yeah. when do you want to move? And, you know, if they start okay. talking... Anything less than three or four years right. for a GM, it's tough. Mm -hmm. Do, is there is there a role? Is there an opening GM and then an operating GM? Is there some op, some operating group? Yeah, let me. We, we've got a few open, especially in China recently. Personally, I've always felt that the lady or gentleman who's opening the hotel and stays there three six months after. I was referring to a mature hotel and yeah. the trade. Yeah. Uh, I like to pull them out after six months. I really believe that the heart, sweat, and tears that go into opening up a hotel and the relationships and the things yeah. that you build end up not necessarily translating to what's going to take to get that three years down to two years. It's just a feeling. There's yeah, yeah, no yeah, yeah, data yeah. behind it. It's just how I feel. And so you like to have your opening GM stay for the period transitioning? Yeah, I like to bring in somebody else and take it to the next level faster. Okay. It just mm. seems to work that way. So do we, do we, now we've got an operating hotel. In my management agreement, should I say that wherever GM's appointed, he can't, I want him there for three years? Uh, it's possible. Uh, possible? Yeah, it's, not, it's just not possible yeah. because you're dealing with human beings. Their right. wife may, husband may not like yeah. the city, yeah. their kids may not like the yeah. school, they may get poached by another right. brand. They may, I mean, there's so many things about people. I, I mean, obviously, half the time when the GM leaves, it's so they don't get on with the owner, but the other half it isn't. And it's impossible, I think it's impossible to, to write the contract wording that right. forces somebody to yeah, In Starwood, what's the, what's the average length of time that a tenure of a GM at one of your hotels? Previously, uh, it's about uh, two years, two years time, but two now, years? yeah, two years time, but now I think we changed the, the rule because we have uh, a many opening hotels, so it will be back to the, the, the owner. If the owner happy with the GM, the GM happy with the owner, this is what we call relationship, and some GM can be seven years and nine years now. Yeah. So that's what we, we, we try to see, because it's, uh, to relocate one GM also is not cheap. So that's what also uh, need to know, uh, the owner also need to understand how, how we work together on this. When you think about the great GMs, when you think about Mandarin Oriental or even sort of uh, Intercontinental in Hong Kong, Jacques Rebel, Jean-Jacques, I mean, these guys have been there for six, seven, ten years? I think he's ten years now. Ten years yeah. now, yeah. 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 Okay. So. And I think, interesting, aren't they going through, didn't they just... They just sold, right? And I think there were some yep. discussions yeah. about the buyer on whether he was going to stay or not stay. There was. There and was. there was a pull. I think I, th I think I had heard that he was sort of ready for the next move. Yet, uh, if I was taking over that hotel, I'd make sure that he's there because he's, he's awesome, there. right? I Don't think leave. the price, uh, there, he, there was a price on his head. It was, yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, I'm just, got more money if I'm he here say, but was it, wasn't there yep. an issue there? Yeah. The key man. It's funny. I, I, one thing that, that, that owners don't tend to get, but I think they should, is if you're if you're getting a, a range of GMs from an existing from existing hotels in that chain, you probably want the right to talk to the owners of the hotels they're coming from. 
Right. Because all too often what you get is, I've got a new opening, mm, which GM is about to get a big argument with the owner, oh, I'll move them in. Right. And that's not necessarily the right GM for your hotel, but it's the right GM for the okay. brand to put in your hotel. So good tip. So when the brand suggests a GM, go and ask the, pr the previous employer of that GM. Good. Okay. Um, this, is, this, is, this is what owners feel like sometimes. That you, Kevin, you're giving away the child? You feel like being locked out? Yeah, I mean, you know, we spend a lot of money usually buying, not building, um, and then you hand over the baby. I mean, bottom line is we can't do what the brands do, right? Right. Uh, but, uh, and that's why we hire them. But it sure feels like that you're handing your baby over to somebody else, and then, uh, you know, you, 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 the, your ability to get involved in that asset and that probably is really restricted. Uh, to be honest with you, and we haven't, we're probably not going to talk about it today, Tony, but, you know, that separating the brand from the management company and the franchise and using that triangle that we've talked about at other yeah. conferences might be the best way to do it, but you're limited by how strong your third-party operators are in that particular market. Mm. So in Asia, usually, you end up dealing directly with the brand, and we struggle with I mean, you know, we understand security of tenure, we understand quiet enjoyment, but um, when the GM spends more time with his regional director or more worried about what the people say in Bethesda or White Plains, if they haven't moved, or Chicago, than they are about me. There's something wrong, right? And right. then when I have that third party operator, it's a short term contract, it's highly incentivized. It, I feel like the owner. With the brand, sometimes I don't feel like the owner. I feel, right. you know, like an outsider. How does Starwood so, sort of address those concerns? I think this one is a, we can see is a how we can build the relationship with the owner and uh, become the transparency with the owner. That's how we can, we can make sure the owner not feel like uh, being locked out and also as a friend with the operator. That's how we try to build the relationship with the owner. So it's the owner not feel like uh, this is mine, but I cannot touch my, my things and I cannot involve on the operation. Some owner, they involve in the operation from the beginning and some owner, they, they just ignore it. The only thing, they just want to see the result. But what we try to do is the transparency is very important. So transparency. We, yes, but your transparency. contract still says that I can't come onto my hotel. I have to give you reasonable notice. So I can only come and see it, see my asset once a, once a month when you'll give me some limited data. You don't have to give me anything. Yes, we in the agreement, yes, the we made The agreement's pretty brutal, isn't it? Yeah, but in the fact, because last time, again, it's a relationship, again, the agreement is more based on the uh, agreement. But how we try to transparency we mentioned is uh, whatever the owner wants, we always right. give it the owner. Uh, yeah. You know, um, uh, for me, this, this argument is, I'm not sure if it's so real. I you know you don't like to hear that, but we, we never have this issue. Actually, it's a, a, almost the opposite, where, where owners tell us, hey man, you, you're managing this thing, just leave me in peace. If I need something, I'll let you know. And maybe that comes because we're really a small bunch. Right. You know, and we're not so in institutionalized. We're, we're a small company, and, and maybe in that way we can spend more time with with our owners. I, I'm not sure, but certainly I don't feel this problem. How many properties? Do you, 40, 50, or how, how many? 80 plus. 80. Yeah. How many maybe properties has Moven picked on? Uh, 84. 84. Okay. You just have a different reaction to that, though. I mean, <laughs> sometimes you're getting locked out all the time, aren't you? Not just by your wife. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tony. I was about to say, you know, with the right lawyer. Actually, all this can be addressed, I mean, adequately addressed in, in, in the documentation. Yeah. So again, it's about being creative and, and making the MA evolve a little bit. Yeah. But it's not like there's any rules in the sand. The problem with an MA is that once it has been executed, then you need to abide with it. Where the problem starts is when you have an executed MA and after people start to challenge it. So you yeah. don't want to get to that stage. So the best thing is really just put everything in an MA, so all the concerns from the owners, and after, you know, should have a fairly happy relationship. Yeah. So you've got to build in things like an audit, the ability to conduct an audit. Audit, yeah. Be something that would happen. Meeting with a regional corporate office. Right. If, if, and, uh, and the ability to meet with, because I've, I've got one at the moment where the, the operator group is refusing for us to meet with the director of marketing. It says the only person you can talk to is the GM. Would that happen at Starwood? Well, I, 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 so, do you mind if I check? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think like in any organization, there are effective ways of doing things and there are yeah. ineffective ways of doing things. I mean, in a, in a car manufacturing plant, you know, if something goes wrong, would you go to the guy on the line or would you go, talk to the manager of the plant? Right. I, I, I don't get this. This seems to be hotels are treated somehow different all the time. We're just a business. Okay, well, well we've got to get the agreement right. So, <laughs> this is what uh, 
This is what the operator wants. Great hotel, huh? Ryan Hotel, that's a good name. <laughs> oh, what do you think? You've got a business going with that? Looks great. Looks great, it's doesn't it? Honor, right? Yeah. Um, okay. We want brand enhancement, control, management fees. Those are the sort of things we were talking about. Uh, hotel development. Okay, so we're in a, in a market like Indonesia. We've got a whole lot of new hotels. Look at Jakarta at the moment. It's uh, what we've got. We've got about 12, 15 new hotels coming up. I think we're going to potentially we've got a doubling of supply in just in the Jakarta four, four, five star market over the next little while. So as you move into the development, is this this sort of works um, for our operator friends? This is what you're after. Yes, as an yep. operator, the consistency is very important, uh, especially with the brand. When we have a 10 brands, we need to make a differentiator between the brands. So, uh, yeah, when you said it's deep owner pocket, it depends on what type of category the owner will choose. If, let's say, the luxury brand, of course, they need to extra money for that uh, because we need to keep uh, uh, enhancement for the luxury brand, for example. But when we go to the four-star brand, that's where we have a, a bit flexibility. Uh, when you said the best money can, um, yes, that's, that's what it is. Uh, about the brand standard, again, we have uh, 10 uh, uh, brands. We need to keep consistency. That's why the brand standard will help us to make sure it's... A so would you, tell me, would you tell me the brand standard, the room size is 32 square metres, and I want to do a four points hotel at 50 yeah. square metres, would you tell me no? Uh, we said the Should. minimum size. So when, when we say the minimum size, let's say four point is a, uh, is a 32, when the owner come to us, like for example, four point Bangkok, for example, 36 meters square, we are more than happy. Right. Mm. So it's, 50, we, we call it the minimum. But 50, you would But when say 50, no. we, will, we will comfort to our luxury brand or we comfort to our upper upscale brand. We try to offer the owner is the right brand and the, the But right would you location. say no? Uh, for, for 50, for, for Bangkok, four 50, points, for no. What? But we offer. Yes, you'd say no. Yes. You say no, but we offer it like Sheraton. Yes, I think we approach it slightly different. It's always fantastic if somebody gives you more and better and whatnot. Yep. But at the end of the day, we would address this as a matter of how much you want to invest and how what sort of a return you can get. Because if, if we if we um, encourage an owner to over, an owner to overspend, um, at some point he's going to be disappointed in his investment, and who's going to get the kick in the rear? That's going to be that's going to be us, and we don't right. want that sort of pressure. So it's better. To say, well, you want to give me 50 squares, cost you this much. Look, in this market, why don't we reduce this, cap the investment, so we have a better marriage afterwards. Right. And, and maybe just one more point when I see what the operator wants. I always find that, and, and I've worked in different industries before, that um, I think the hotel operators know pretty much what they want. What I find in this business there's often hotel owners who actually don't know why they're in the game. Right. And I've never seen this in other industries like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we quite know what we want. Okay, so what happens if you know, I'm in a three-star market in West Jakarta and I want to put in a, uh, you know, a luxury collection hotel? I mean, this, this is an owner who says, I went and stayed in one of your luxury collections hotel. It looks mm -hmm. fantastic. I'd like to have it in my backyard. Um, you know, I've got a business park and I want to put a, ho you know, completely inappropriate hotel. I mean, this is the sort of point, isn't it, that you've got. Yeah. You so what do we do then? You'd be better off saying no. Yes. You'd say no? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because you're going to have trouble down the road. And f what's the worst thing for a hotel operator to happen? Is to open a hotel, stay for two years, and then be in the news that you've been booted out from because you're not performing. Right. Well, you know, we always don't perform. <laughs> So how many, how many owners actually do the feasibility studies before they go down the track of doing this? How many get that fabulous company called HVS? Uh, uh, Does that happen? Stefan? It's, it's, it's slightly, in Asia, you know, often that they don't get the feasibilities, do they? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it depends on the, the kind of hotel and the amount of capital you're investing, right? Um, feasibility studies, again, they're very, um, they're, they're full of disclaimers, right? Right. The, the optimal thing, especially for a new build, would be to update it on a yearly basis, just to really make sure that both parties are aligned in terms of what the expectation should be, right? The, the, the biggest issue is when you have a feasibility that was done five years earlier, and the market has totally changed, and suddenly the hotel opens, right? right. So feasibility is, is the first step. It's, it's a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. Right. Mm. Feasibilities? 
I mean, yes, I think most owners still do them. I think, you, you know, the world, especially in someone like Indonesia, is divided into people. I've, I've, I've met both sort of at this conference between people who just want an ego, you know, an ego development. And they're much more interested in which brands they're talking to than getting a feasibility. You've got other new owners who are very cautious. I was speaking to somebody yesterday. It's like, you know, my family has land. We want to go into the business. Mm. But we're very nervous. We're nervous about hiring a brand and committing to the fees. We're and obviously, for someone like that, then doing a feasibility, they, they, will, they will be cautious and do that. So quite, quite a range, I think. Kevin, on your new builds, you always get feedback? Yeah, always, yeah. Maybe too always. much. Always? I think Maybe it's too probably much. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there are... Places I know, they go, well, look, you know, I, I stayed at a Waldorf Astoria hotel in New York. It's fantastic. I want to have one of those. I want to put it here. Um, you know, completely inappropriate. No feasibility done. Is it a 100-year management agreement or what? Yeah, yeah, with a 100-year management agreement. Okay, <laughs> let's just talk about, um, so we've got our hotel open now, and we've got um, our property improvement plans. So, looks fine. So that's what the owner says. Just, uh, just lick a paint, be good, no problem. Um, the operator wants a soft refurbishment every five to seven years. So those in the business here, that's what you're looking at, five to seven, want the latest gimmicks. And we've got this industry capex study, which has now been released. I think mm -hmm. our, yes, our good friends from yes, Benjamin's. Yes, yeah, yes, West yes. here. Yeah, I'm not here. Um, What's being this is a study, you, you know, the, 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 um, Cap the, the capex yeah. study, which is um, put out by ISHC, which looks at what is the CapEx requirements for the life of a hotel, take a 25-year hotel. And basically, it's looking at soft goods, case goods, every five to seven years. We all agree with that? For our friends out here? Yeah. It all makes sense? <laughs> what? Carpet, beds, furniture, everything done in five to seven? The thing, Tony, is that more and more, you know, lifestyle brands are, are following the retail model, right? So it's, it's lower FF&E, but therefore the cycle is shorter. Right. So if this is embedded, I mean, it really depends when the hotel was built, but I think the newer hotels have a shorter lifespan. Simply so, so more like five, four or five years to do a refurb of the furniture? Eventually, yeah. Hmm. Cool. What do you require? So fast. I think it's uh, seven to ten years because it's, I know it depends on the quality, uh, but at the end it's based on the fact we have a few hotels. It's, uh, yeah, I think it's about seven to ten years for the Seven carpet. to ten years? Yeah, for planning I would agree, but in reality you, okay. you can evaluate it when it comes. Okay, okay. Bathrooms, when do we need to do bathrooms for all those with existing hotels? When do you need to replace your bathroom? You're getting all the practical tips here. Some of our hotels is uh, even 20 years bathroom. I mean, it's like, it's uh, because it's uh, the quality from the beginning. How long? Tw 10, 12? 20. 20? 20, 20. 20 years. 20. Whoa. That's what he said. 20 years. <laughs> Put it in the contract. Oh, yeah. well, the boss would agree with that. <laughs> Kevin, how, when do you replace your bathrooms? Yeah, I don't, you know, other than making sure all my new hotels have washlets, you know, because of having lived in Japan as long as I had, that's a right. requirement. But, uh, uh, yeah, no, that's, I mean, Tony, but this, these things are not in the contracts, are they? I mean, as far as the years, right? <laughs> very rarely. Oh, yeah. yeah very and I think the brands are pretty okay when it comes to this. I think, uh, you know, they've got the reserve. We try to spend it. We talk about it. We've got uh, hotels now that we have this discussion, and they have to balance it, but uh, it's not in the contract by year. So, and I think... Uh, what is interesting is how you define certain things. Are they normal renovation or are yep. they CapEx renovation? And which bucket do you spend that money on? Yeah. And actually, some brands are better than others to try to be very particular about how they word it. You know, and Marriott's on one end and, and maybe Movin picks on the other. But uh, <laughs> that's where we spend a lot of time on. Is Arguing whether it's routine capital expenditure yeah, or a major room. Yeah, and which yeah. bucket does it come from, the reserve yeah. or the owner it, funds? And, and who controls the reserve with, say, Marriott? Is it still them or do you now have a... Okay, so let's talk about reserves for our case. So, so you'll no, find in your hotel management agreement a requirement that the, each month the operator will take out of the hotel cash flows somewhere between 2 and 4% mm -hmm. of gross revenues will be put into an FF&E reserve which will be expensed annually over the life of the hotel and consistent with the annual plan. Is that, we're all happy with that? So yeah, I think some, some HMCs are starting to, um, there's no uh, FF&E reserve required anymore. Right. The latest trend. Well, okay. well, we, well, we progressed that. We used to have a thing called the notional reserve, where you didn't actually have to take yeah, the money, but notionally yeah. you didn't account. Well, you wouldn't do that in Indonesia. No. No. In Indo well, I've not seen that yeah. it done happen in Indonesia yeah, in with a notional Indonesia. reserve. But in Indonesia, I can't say. Our first is understanding. Yeah. 
and that doesn't have that provision, but in, in general, we do that. But can you imagine that money just going to that account and just sitting yeah, here waiting? It's, there's got to be a better use for that money. Right. So, Kevin, you're a, you're a money guy. It, you, you hate <laughs> to see that money going and sitting and earning. I mean, I understand. I understand. But, I mean, if you've got a core with 100 hotels and maybe they have one owner that has 10 or 12 hotels, I'm sure they don't require that the money goes into an account, that they have some relationship with these guys that say, listen, we trust you, uh, or a letter of credit, or it's all in the books. It's accrued. Um, and there's a discussion on who spends it, right, based upon the yeah, budget yeah. approval. Yeah. Boy, boy, that's bad use right. of money. So you, you think that's lazy money, money, having put it aside over there, and there's an opportunity I think it's cost distrust. Yeah. You. I think it's, I don't trust you, so put it, the money in there, right? right. But I think yeah. th this, this, the, it's this time for the operator to make sure to, to convince the owner how we can spend the FFN e even every year. I know it's, you know, finish every year, but how we can convince the owner, let's say, for the, for the something new or something, to keep the, the hotel also in, in, the, right. in the good shape. Mm. Well, you know, if you, if you believe in management agreements, and we're sitting here discussing that, and you put a notional FF &E funding in there and say on the 10 days demand, the money needs to be provided. So if you believe in agreements, then you believe in that as well. Right. Right? If you don't yep. believe in them, then... <laughs> but operators like to have the cash there. Yeah. <laughs> you can split it. You can do a 50-50. Yeah. yeah. You know? And you can propose to right, share the Right, okay, it's an idea, 50-50, yeah. you put half in and half as a promise. Yeah. So we and you're saying, you're saying, Stefan, sometimes no FF&E reserve <laughs> at all, we just do it in accordance with the budget. Well, the other issue is, uh, as Kevin said, it's better use for the money, but the other thing is, is the money even sufficient? You see what I'm saying? Is these two, three, four percent came, but depending on the property, the location, the actual cost of equipment, construction, whatever, it, it could vary, right? So right. that's, again, something that needs to be addressed pre-documentation that needs to be, let's say, diligently researched. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this report, let's talk about that. Is the 4% going to be enough? I'm an owner of a hotel. I've got a 4% FF&E reserve. Is that going to be enough over a life of 20 years to renovate the hotel? That report says definitely not. It says the number is more like 9 to 12% will actually be needed that when you look at the life cycle of the hotel. That makes sense to everybody here? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah. 4%, don't expect the 4% is going to solve all your problems. Yeah. Correct? No. no. Just help you go, by the way. I think, I mean, to be, can I be controversial for a minute here? I think oh, one, of the, one, one of the issues, though, is we're all thinking about how little the brand to spend, right? As owners, you don't want to spend a lot of money. But one of the big problems that the industry is going to face, I think, is that whenever the brands want an exciting new concept, the big, you know, the big brand companies like Starwood, they invent a new brand for it, which is great because it also gets around your radius restrictions. But the problem is that, that the new brands that are being created, both by the, those guys and by other people like Citizen M or Mama Shelter or whatever, mm -hmm are gradually taking over the consumer market. And the brands are not focusing nearly enough on how you do renovations on Marriott's and Sheraton's and Novotel's. I mean, they'll, up, they'll upgrade the spec, but those brands are gradually falling further and further behind to becoming legacy brands. And that's what 80% of the hotel stock in the world is. So maybe owners need to focus less on the amount and more on, you know, what is the new rollout standard and is it sexy enough? Right, but I mean, what would a Marriott be without that lovely green and red carpet? Well, exactly. <laughs> you know. but, but it's a serious point, right? I mean, uh, Because yeah, yeah. you know, your, your, your Generation X doesn't want to go to a bog-standard, boring box hotel anymore. Right. And unless you reinvent that, that's 80% of the inventory in the United States for sure. Okay, you've obviously been displayed. You've got a wealth of knowledge up here. So um, <laughs> start to think about your question that you want to, um, you want to ask our panel. But let's just talk about so the, the messy bit of management fees. Base fees and incentive fees, those new to the business, base fees, percentage of gross revenue, incentive fees based on gross operating profit. Oh, let's go, stay with this. What's happening on this? Um, okay, we hold the old story. Well, US used to be three and 10, I think we heard mm -hmm. yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, now the formula is two and eight. Mm -hmm. What's, uh, <laughs> that'd be nice to get a two and eight, would it? <laughs> From well, an point. Yeah, yeah. First of all, it depends what you call a base fee. Do you include your license, your, your license and branding fees yep. in there or not? That, that there's different ways of doing it. Um, what I think yes. is clearly that there's more pressure on the base fees nowadays, and people want to see something more performance heavy rather than uh, base fee heavy. Um, in terms of fee, there's a big range. It depends a little bit for us. You know, if it's a, if it's a massive hotel, if you're looking 2,000 rooms, 1,500 rooms, I think you have to bit more flexibility and you know you look at your fee income and you can jiggle that a little bit then right. but if it's 100 rooms then obviously in order to make okay. it worthwhile it's okay. got to be an, it's a, a bigger hotel one. you might be a little more yeah Kevin you, you've got plenty of experience in terms of what I've noticed over the years is that um, 
It seems that the fees, you get the best fees the further north you go and the worst fees further south. So for operators, you get your best fees in Tokyo and your worst fees in Tasmania. That's what it <laughs> seems to me. And that would leave Indonesia sort of stuck somewhere in the middle. That'd be about... I mean, seems about right. I mean, you know... Seems about... Because you've got a lot of hotels in Japan, yeah, right? Yeah, no, that's, that's right. But uh, I, I think just to go back, we are seeing that the gross fees, and we would include uh, the licensing, is lower than it was in the past, right? right? And the base is higher than it was in the past. And, I mean, the incentive, and we're okay with that. We, we okay. think it aligns interest, and we are okay to see that higher, and uh, as long as you deduct the base fee from GOP as a way to, to start that calculation. So um, I think it's better alignment that way. And, and we understand that there needs to be something at the top, but, uh, and of course, the bigger it is, the smaller that number should be because it gets to be a huge number. Um, but, uh, yeah, the fees are a little bit higher on the north side, aren't they? Right. You know. Okay. So, so you're trending, <coughs> Stefan, you see this, base fees are getting a bit smaller and incentive fees are getting bigger. Is that what roughly you're seeing? Yeah. yeah, just to add something on this, the nature of the, the hotel as well and, and the location would dictate the structure of the incentive fee. I mean, in India, where 50% of your F &B, uh, of your right. revenue is F&B, it doesn't require the same level of management, say, as uh, limited service in Singapore. Where right. yeah. So, again, they need, they need, it requires flexibility and not saying, listen, this is our standard fees. It's like, listen, I'm giving you a hotel that's either easy or challenging to, to manage, and I'm going to reward you accordingly. Right. So that's where the incentive fee comes in. License fee, fine. I mean, that should be fixed, but the incentive fee needs to be fine-tuned. Uh, Tony, you know, the, you know, the funny thing about this, we talk about this all the time, but you had mentioned before about transparency. This is important, but it's not as important as all those other fees. Yeah, absolutely. And right. there are some brands who do a better job of being honest and transparent about what those are, you know, right. and making it easy as opposed to having to send a letter to a corporate office saying, tell me what's in the accounts. Um, and so I think that's where the distrust comes from. So if okay. this is one fee, uh, but it's all those other things. And I know they change. Sometimes you pay for training and you pay right to the headquarters as opposed to a third party or whatnot. Um, but that's where the pressure comes okay. in the relationship. So you'll get, you'll get your monthly report, which will have a line saying base fee and incentive fee. And then the next thing will be 17 pages of itemized charges of a whole lot of stuff being things You know like what? In that, in, in that situation, I'm okay with the item just as long as I get the itemization. Right. You usually don't get it, or you have to ask for it, or it takes right. forever, and you find out that somebody came in and you got dinged with some travel. That's, you know, I mean, no, I usually, and I, we've looked at that. More often than not, it's probably the most efficient way to do the business is go ahead and charge the headquarter for something right. because it distributed some cost of some insurance that they were able to get a better price than we were. I'm okay with that. Right, but what happens it's if... getting you, that invoice, you know, yeah. getting that breakdown. It's, it's, it's a very, very good point. I think re rechargeables, as it's often referred to, I think, is... Uh, we did, a, we did a huge study on that, which is not a really official study because it's kind of hard to get the information, <laughs> uh, just for an in internal purpose to see where we stand. And we've sort of compressed that and, and used that as a, as a document that we, can, that we share actually right. with, with owners and say this is mandatory stuff that you will have to expect and these are things that mm. are, we can discuss and are voluntary. And uh, it's a real strong tool for us because uh, it What was the percentage? All in. I, I, I can't. Come on. It's, no, it's not, it's not fair. If I would do yeah, what is it. 15? You did it once. Uh, well, 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 I mean, I've looked at it on a few 17. things. I mean, when Host and Marriott split, it was very interesting because uh, yeah. okay. all the hosts were all the skeletons Marriott. were. Yeah. And so they had when they did related party charges, you saw what it was, and it was that they were paying 15 percent of revenue. 50 percent. 15, one five. 15 percent. 15 percent of revenue was in the was, other. Was charges. going from Host to Marriott. No, no, in oh. total. So if the if the base and incentive fee were five percent, then they were paying 10 percent of us. Right. And I think that's about, I mean, it's usually... Yeah, we all think it's four to six, right? We all think, and that's a good management fee, but that's just part of it, right? That's just then the it's top. another 10 for everything So else. let's go to rule of thumb here. So we're not talking management fees. The other charges I pay to the owner represent roughly what percentage of revenue? Yeah. How much? About 10. About 10? Yeah. Okay. I mean, so if I'm paying more than 10, as a rule of thumb here for our budding hotel owners out here. That, yeah, 10 and 5, right? So that's 15. Right. That's a, that's a lot of money. A lot of money. The five is what you see on the front page of every P&L, right? right? Okay. It's the revenue, total revenue, and the base fee, right? And it's always four to six percent, depending where you're in, in a 300-room hotel of Sheraton, right? It's, it's, it's going to be in that range. But it's the other stuff that's important. But again, you know, if it's just reservations or just IT or just sales and marketing, then that's one thing. But it's all these other ones. 
it might be okay. It could be 17 or 20 and might be more efficient than trying to go to a third party. So you really just have to be able to discuss it. And my point is you don't always have a chance to discuss it. You have to go clod. And when you talk to the financial controller and you're asking, can you send me a copy? And you're starting to feel like, well, you know, there is a distrust, right? So it's sort of the trick is how to do it. And I'm sure you can manage it and talk. And most brands will discuss it with you. But to have to go back and do that is sort of like uh, mm -hmm. it's that whole relationship. I, I had a beauty um, just last year. I started to query a charge, and it was a, a Venezuelan marketing fund that I was apparently supporting out of my Singapore hotel. I mean, what Very the nice. hell? About, <laughs> you know. Big demand generator. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There yeah. Are not a lot of business for Venezuela. Yeah. In there, are, there are so many tricks. I mean, when, when we set up Hofka, one, one of the issues we had that kind of stimulated it was a hotel where it was, it was a brand that recharged the GM rather than you paying a salary. Mm -hmm. And he was also the regional controller for four other countries. And we right. found, when we investigated, we were paying 100% of his package, even though he spent a third of his time doing other stuff. So it's not just charges, it's allocations and right. so many different ways. And it may not be the brand's deliberately trying to stuff you, it just sometimes happens that way. So if, but let's take, let's take, if I'm an owner of a hotel and my GM is the regional guy, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Wouldn't that mean I've got the best GM? Or is it only the fact that I'm only probably going to have a third of a good he, GM? He was a really good GM, I can tell you that. I mean, we admired that he was a great GM. Right. We just didn't want to pay for the time he was marketing the brand in another country. As a general rule, if, I, if they're trying to make my GM the regional GM, what do you do, Stefan? Are you happy with that? Well, yeah, first of all, you look at how many hotels he's taken care of, and then you prorate it based on rooms or revenue. I mean, that you can figure out, but there should be some proration. There's got to be a proration. You'd be happy to have him, though, sure. as a general rule? Yeah. I mean, I've just, you know, some people put in the management agreement that the GM will not be a regional GM. Yeah, 75, 25, you know, so, m pretty much I'm happy, but the warning bells go off, you know, and right. I have to do more work as an AM and teach my team how to look for things and how to balance it. But more often than not, you're probably getting a good guy or a good leader. Okay. Yeah. Righto, just term and termination. Ooh. So, term, how long? Asia, Indonesia in particular? 20 years. 10, 15 years? Yeah, 20. Yeah. We're averaging about, re realistically, we're averaging about 15. 15? Yeah. I'm 20. Uh, 20 you want 30. 20? You give me in a loft, though, for 10? Uh, no. The lowest for our LF and 4 point is the 15. Yes. Lowest is 4 yes. point is 15. Yes. Okay, and if I want a W, how long? W is 30 years now. 20? 30. 30. 30. 30. 30 years for a luxury product. Right. 30 years. <laughs> Because if he can get That's it. That's imprisonment, isn't it? I, I, I don't think the issue is how long the contract <laughs> yeah. is. Because I, I actually think it's a point that owners don't always realize. There's a very asymmetric negotiation here. The net present value of management companies is the net present value of the length of their contracts. Mm -hmm. They want a long contract. If you yeah. can terminate them for poor performance, or if you sell the hotel, or with a penalty if you just decide you've had enough of them, then a long contract's fine. And they'll give you more for having the long contract. Okay, so what rights of termination are we going to have But I now? think the valuation in, for those companies, they do look at those termination rights, and they discount that long term. So I, oh, that's all I, that's, I, at least it's hard to get. But you know, I, we understand long terms. And you know, if it's a luxury product with residential, of course, yeah. that's different. It, you want it, it a long term. You want this project. Right. Sometimes if the owner wants it long term. Yeah. For yeah. different yeah. reasons, it's right? Not, yeah, for different reasons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, <coughs> so mixed use project. Happy to have a longer management agreement because mm -hmm. the name, the halo effect from the brand on the resi component, and it becomes problematic if you take the yes. brand off after 15 years. <laughs> We've been down that track. Okay, uh, let's talk about rights of termination. <clears throat> okay, what's the first one? On one end, we've got termination without cause, at any time, end it. Instant divorce. So we've got that on one end. On the other end, no rights of termination. Let's move along a little bit. Performance termination using, say, that the hotel uh, that I've reached 85% of the budgeted GOP for a relevant year, if I fail that twice, maybe have a right to kick me out. Yep. Yeah. That's a good yep. One. Yeah. We're all happy. That's a sort of pretty standard term. It is. So if you're an owner, you should be looking to try and get something like that in your management agreement. I mean, happy with that, Starwood? Yes. Okay. It's, all that's going to do is... We, all we that's going right to do is drive down. Okay. <laughs> for, to two years, 85% with a right to cure. Yep. You want a right to cure it and pay that's me some money one to time. make... Limited it to twice, two cures One only? Time yeah. And, uh, yeah, but a clawback is okay. Ah, and a clawback. That's okay, right? Ooh. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'll leave a clawback as long as it's only one. You allow a clawback on the performance test? Hmm. Oh, wow. okay. No. Oh, okay. That's a good idea. That's fair. Our French what, friends. What, what, what doesn't work is when you have the double performance test. So there's a rev car test and uh, a GOP. Oh, you mean so now both? both. Yeah. <coughs> then so it, what is uh, between GOP and rev car? 
But the, the problem with the, is that it also does is drive the budget down. I mean, the rep power is almost okay, and I mm -hmm. think with the information you can, as long as both parties agree yes. uh, before and then after the changes. But all we do is get low budgets. From that 85%, it's 85% of budget, right? Yep. So what you get is conservative budgets, and okay, your owner wants one and operator wants another. You can't, you know, but if it's because there's a termination involved, that's right. You so know, isn't they, it, they're so much better at it than we are, right? We we can do it. We we you know we're looking at many hotels. We don't spend a lot of time on it. They're spending all of July and August trying to figure out how to trick me, right? You know, yep. so, <laughs> so so all it is is by, oh the inflation, this and that, new supply, la la, you know. So it doesn't really help. So isn't that a, isn't that a problem? If we've got a if we've got a GOP budget test, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's a, it's going to drive the whole yeah. budget performance. It's yeah. less aspirational. So I might waive that for termination upon sale, right? It's so important. You trade us. that. Yeah. You want termination on sale. It's so important. Let's just talk about the second test. So we do have another test, which is an RGI using our good okay. friends at Smith Travel Research. We look at a basket of competitor hotels and we look at a rev par of that basket and we see how are we matching up against that rev par. And we can do that in Indonesia because we've got the Smith Travel data. So that's another test. You don't do we like, like that? I, like I mean, I thought, right you know, you get to pick the hotels, yeah. you pick them in advance, you adjust them yeah. together, um, and uh, what number do you use, 90, 85? 85 or 90. Yeah. I mean, and that's one issue if you've got a super luxury hotel. I was looking at a contract in Europe recently where the hotel was projecting as a super luxury brand, they would do a 50% higher rate than any other resort hotel in Europe. Right. That's what they and, come to you with. Yeah. yeah. And then they wanted an RGI test at 90% of the conference. Yeah, I love that one. So <laughs> what, what, what I've actually seen that works much better is you do, you do a benchmark year and see what the RGI is. And they have to do 90% of that benchmark going forward. Right. That's, That's not, much better, yeah. I think. And okay. some of the, the, for the second measurement for the uh, competition set, sometimes we don't have the competition in the market. Yeah. For example, like the secondary city. Some they not they not submit the number. Then both sides have to say. So we only it, have a one or two hotels, which to, is we can have to we can go, compare. Yeah. So right. this has become the problem for the for the rev part. Okay. Have any of you, have any have either of you two actually invoked the performance termination test and got paid a cure on it? I've been paid. Cure, We're um, you know. just a couple. Any questions? We're into this nasty bit of term and termination. I've any questions from our audience here in relation to that? On a couple of years. Anybody in the midst of negotiating a management back. agreement at the moment want some free tips? Right. Right. Even throw in some legal advice. It's all <laughs> happening today. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So this is not on sale. You want termination on sale? Okay. So termination on sale. So I want to sell the asset. How much? Uh, how much are you going to pay him for his fees? Two years. For two years. A bit tight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like you're a really good negotiator, you might get through. What do you think? What is Stefan? How many years are you going to pay for termination? Well, on again, it depends on the, on, on the value of the contract, as yep. uh, you mentioned earlier, the NPV, right? I mean, it needs to be fair. The, the contract from an HMC perspective is going to get approved based on a certain NPV, right? Now, if the two, three years is worth 100 million, you will take it. If the two, three years is worth 100,000, you may ask for 10 years, right? Now, if you look at the Hilton in Hong Kong, that was in the late 90s, they had to pay $120 million. $120 million. To get out of it, right? So, but because Chung Kong back, back then had a better use for that site. Right. Okay, so sometimes two times, maybe three times, and you're saying it depends on the hotel. Well, then. The NPV of the contract. Then, then we come back to fees, because you cannot dissociate the term with the fee structure. You may agree to an owner who only wants 10 years, but a much higher fee structure because he's saying, I need the money, right? Okay. So termination on sale, that's really important for you. Yeah. I mean, and you also have to look at it and all you, together. You, 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 know, you you're looking, want that? That's yeah. One of your been, and you're willing to give something. You know, we've given longer contracts too, right? So they can, you know, from 15, we'll add another five, but we okay. need this. And what's the term? You know, so you always put it together. You can't look at it just as one. I'm just, it's something that adds value to us as we go into it. Would but you have a moratorium so you can't be exercised for the first five years or something like that, maybe? Yes. We, yeah. yeah. I mean, if the, usually, you know, it's, it's more what happens next, right? So right. it's in there for the long term and it creates value for the next guy. So, yeah, if it works about best, it's, it's, the objective is not to, to do it in a couple of years, right? And, right? and we realize that it's not so nice to have the name come on and off a building for either side. Right. Star, we're going to give us a termination on sale? We, we try to not to do. You try not to? Yes. Right. We try to avoid. Uh, so far, I signed the deal. Is, you, know, you haven't done it in Indonesia? Yes. No? Indonesia is okay. Right. You might? No? 
Uh, yeah, we, yeah, okay, we, okay. Well, no, we've actually taken a different approach. Rather than go to a calculation, we agree on a fixed amount right from the beginning. Right. Now, yeah. of course, we work that out in, with a formula, but two uh, years. Okay. Well, fixed amount is two years. <laughs> just easy. Just easy. <laughs> no, it's just easy. You have to be how long or what the fees are. So. Good. Okay. So you might get it. Uh, limited period time. Any more questions up there? We'll roll on to our term and termination. Termination without pause, any time, I'll just pay you, not without sale. We don't see too much of that, do we, Stefan, in this part of the world? Nope. It shouldn't be allowed. I mean, again, I mean, if we come back to the basic, you know, agency, nature of the agency agreement and fiduciary yeah. obligation, why would an owner terminate you, right? Yeah. So, okay. Uh, annual plan. This is important. Worthwhile spending time and effort on? Absolutely. Every year? You said they, they spend... They spend six, 60 days. Yeah, no, it's not that bad. No, no, I understand what you mean. But no. as an asset manager, we, re we do really want our guys to, like that owner you had, we really want the operators to operate. And this is the one time a year where we spend a lot of time. Right. We don't, we go, you know, I'm looking at P&Ls now with uh, our team. You know, they don't look at the P&Ls. They look at a package of information. So they'll have the top page. They won't, they don't look at it monthly, you know, and they're, they're looking at it quarterly or maybe year to date, and they look at it halfway through the year. Really what they do, they're looking at it once a year. So we spend a lot of time. A, a, on the annual plan for looking backwards to just on, for a cost and revenue basis and then agreeing to what go forward because you're using that as a benchmark throughout yeah. the year. And it allows the operator to, to relax and do what they do best if we spend time at this one time a year. Right. So it's an important exercise worth spending time. Stefan, you do a fair bit of this in asset management? Well, the annual plan is fine is if, if you, let's say, you know, you don't deviate by more than plus minus 5%, right? Mm -hmm. But if there's a crisis, be it an external factor or internal factor, it's important that there's corporate support to rediscuss and sit down with the owner. Okay, so the annual plan's not set in stone. We've got to have an ability to, to adjust the annual plan during the term of the year as well. Correct? Mm. That's what you're saying? I mean, just one of the things I'm thinking of now, we've set these budgets, and if you're thinking about termination, they're low. The XCOM, especially GM, I mean, they're really highly incentivized on that yeah. the budget. And they're making 40, 50, 60% more on their salary uh, depending on how much more they're beating the budget, right? You know, right. so and that's a good thing broadly. But if it's just mailed in, or if it's arbitrarily low because of some termination clause, we're paying big bucks for something that doesn't feel so nice, right? right? You know, right. And so okay. it's not really a win-win in that case. But, but what I'd good, say so. to that though is, we we are right, we, we are encouraged to, to to drive the business as well. I mean, and to drive our GMs and not to give it away because at the end of the day, the only income we do have are the fees. So. So we want to drive that as much as we can. So we, we have a GM who is motivated to, to perform that as well. Okay, okay. Uh, nearly there. Heaven forbid, disputes, law of the contract will probably be Indonesia for your management agreement, correct? Yeah. Uh, it needs to be under the local laws pretty much. Yeah. Uh, however, where am I going to do my dispute? Where, where would most people, what are we going to do? We're going to go to Singapore arbitration maybe? Happy to do that? That's often what, what we find in these yeah. agreements in this part of the world? Okay. Yes. It seems to be, yeah. Simple, yep. Simple. Process yeah. is growing. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we're going to do there. Good. Well, I hope you have that leverage. Let's uh, quickly then, we've got um, non disturbance agreements, which we talk about, which means the bank comes in, uh, owner has gone belly up, you want to keep your management agreement in place, correct? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. A little bit difficult to get in this part of the world. Yes, yep. it's, uh, it's quite difficult to get it, but sometimes we uh, we we tell the owner why we need it, and then yep. that's uh, how owner can explain to the bank if they if they need it the NDA. Right, so. bit of a struggle though, but yep. that's what that's all about. Okay, right. Well, we um, we are just about. Any questions at all from our gang? You've been exhausted at the end of the day. All pretty much finished. Right. Well, um, what I'd like you to do is, um, is to thank our wise people up here um, for sharing their experience in such a frank and honest way. So if you could join me in thanking our panel. Great. All right.